Well, today we're going to begin a study in the book of 1 Corinthians. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to apologize in advance. If I cough a little bit, I'll try not to, or sniffle, but I came back from that wonderful vacation with a bad cold, and I got it from hugging and kissing on my granddaughter, Hope Evelyn, and it was worth every minute of it. But I'll just apologize in advance for that. Anytime we do an in-depth study of the scriptures like this, there are three concepts, three words you might say that we need to understand. And they are the words expository, exegesis, and hermeneutics. And um, a big part of today's message is just going to be introducing the series and introducing the book. But it's important to understand these three things because for the next however many weeks, and by the way, I don't know how many weeks this is going to take, and I, and I try not to predetermine that because I want to let the Holy Spirit, you know, flow through the process and, um, and um, teach us. So I don't know how long it's going to take, but through this whole process that we're about to go through, it, it's going to be probably at least somewhere between 13 and 16 weeks. Uh, but that's, that's normal here. We preach God's word and, and don't mind how long it takes. But through the whole process, we're going to be doing these three things. And I want you to understand them. Expository really just means we're going on an exposition. We're going to put on our mining hats and our pickaxes and buckets, and we're going to go in and we're going to mine God's word for every possible thing that we can find in it that he has for our lives. The interesting thing about preaching is that I've always said if you are preaching a message to a hundred people, there are a hundred different messages being preached. Isn't that something, how God does that? It, it's different for every single person. So you're going to mine things out of this study that are going to be specific for you, that the Holy Spirit is going to teach you that you've never seen before. I know I say this every time I start a new series or, or preach a message, but it is the truth. I don't know how many times I've taught the book of 1 Corinthians, but I saw things this time in this message today that I've never seen before. It just, I just somehow it just opened up and I had never seen it quite the way that uh, I saw it this time. And I'm not exaggerating that. You know, to, to, to you know, support my view that God shows you something different every time you, you open up the scriptures. I'm saying that because it's true. I, was, I came down the stairs telling Evie, I, I never saw this before. <laughs> Listen to this. And, and I hope that that happens for you. If, if you've studied the book of 1 Corinthians a hundred times, I hope that this study is, is new and different. So we're going on an exposition, and that's the word expository, the type of teaching that we do in a series like this. The second one is exegesis, and because it sounds like it has the word Jesus in it is, is a coincidence. Exegesis just means we're going to take as good a look as we can in the amount of time that we have on Sundays to really consider the fullness of the, the book. It was really a letter when it was written, not a book. But in other words, who wrote it? Who was it written to? What were they going through at that time? When you put yourself in the culture or the society at that time, it makes a lot of difference in the message that was delivered because of the circumstances at that time or maybe some of the customs or, or culture of the people that were unique to that time. If you don't understand that, you, you wouldn't have any clue what that means. So we're going to do a good exegesis as we go through this process. And then we're going to do good hermeneutics. And um, uh, the, the word hermeneutics just basically, in, in my words, means taking the then and there and making it relate to the here and now. So in other words, once we understand all of that about the scriptures, how do we apply that to our lives? What are some of the parallels? And oh my goodness, there are endless parallels in this book with our society and our lives today. So we're going to do an expository series. We're going to do good exegesis and the best I can with hermeneutics to teach it. 1 Corinthians is the first of two letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to 
a church he personally founded and pastored for a year and a half in a city called Corinth uh, before moving on to Ephesus. Now, this was really no small endeavor because Corinth was not only a bustling hub of world commerce, it was a severely, severely pagan region. You, you might want to do a study, just Google it sometimes and begin to do a study on Corinth at this time. This is about 50 uh, A.D., roughly. And I would suggest if you do your study that you don't have minors <laughs> in the room that can see the screen because you're going to see some stuff that was just outrageous. The paganism was just off the charts. After he starts that church there, and, and moves on to Ephesus. Several years later, Paul receives a very concerning letter indicating that the church he thought was rock solid on the gospel of Jesus Christ was slipping back into some of their old pagan ways, none the least of which was becoming distracted from the true gospel of Jesus Christ, albeit by some pretty impressive teachers. There were now problems such as factions, lawsuits, immorality, questionable practices, abuse of the Lord's Supper and spiritual gifts. What a surprise this must have been to the Apostle Paul. Imagine you go and you spend 18 months planting this church, discipling these people, making sure that their understanding, their doctrine as we call it, was, was solid and founded on the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And you leave them and you think everything is fine and then you get this letter from somebody that says they're all messed up. How disappointing. It, it was probably the things that he read, which we're going to read, were uh, probably a shock to the Apostle Paul. Probably surprised him and shocked him. And I, I can imagine he was no doubt disappointed and not only disappointed because he worked so hard to get him out of that, it would be disappointing to find out that they're slipping back. That he'd be disappointed in his own, you know, um, self as far as his efforts going awry or seeming to. He would be disappointed for the people too, knowing that they were back in the danger zone, that they were now slipping back into things that would could possibly cost them eternity. So he writes back to them. And in addition to words of discipline, he also shares words of counsel to several questions raised by the Corinthian believers. This letter has been called a, a masterpiece of pastoral counsel. It, it is a masterpiece for pastors to learn how to handle situations and how to pastor, and it is a masterpiece for churches like ours to glean from, to learn from, and be guided by. So what does this old letter have to do with us? It has everything to do with us as a church and as individuals. First of all, we live in a very pagan society. Did you happen to notice? <laughs> have you had your TVs on lately? Yeah. We, too, like the Corinthians, live in a very pagan society. Secondly, every one of us um, has been, after we received Christ, has been confronted with the temptation to relapse back to our old ways. I think if, if I poured truth serum over everybody and interviewed you, you would say that that was the case. At some point, it may have taken a different amount of time for each of us, but at some point we were tempted to slowly slip back into our old ways. We come to salvation, we come to the cross of Christ, and we accept him as our Savior, which everybody loves a Savior. And then we take the next step and, and accept him as our Lord, which is more difficult because that means you're going to do what he says because you know it's best for you. So we come to the cross, we're all excited, and then at some point 
in our life, we, we begin to slip back and, and, and go back, revert to some of our old behaviors. It's like we're inching away from the cross. And thirdly, we have a host of teachers available to us from all over the world teaching their opinion of Scripture and their philosophies on how one should live. This is a really incredible time. I remember a time in my life when the only way that you could hear a message other than going to church was either on television, and it was very limited when I was young, or maybe on the radio, but now, you know, it went from there to our computers, but then you had to go to your computer. Remember that big box that used to sit under the desk? You know, you had to go to it. Now you don't even have to go to it. You've got it right in your pocket. Uh, 24-7, you, you can click and, and get anybody from anywhere in the world teaching or preaching about Scripture. And therefore, I've given this uh, message today the, the subtitle of The Seduction of Sophia. The Seduction of Sophia. And you may be thinking, Paul, I've read the book of 1 Corinthians before, and I don't remember a mention of anybody named Sophia. Well, trust me, 1 Corinthians has a lot to say about Sophia. Let's pray. Father, as always, I thank you for your word. Every time I come to it, it just amazes me how you have not only carefully preserved it for us, but through the power of your Holy Spirit, when we read it, study it, hear it taught, apply it to our lives, it, it brings health and life and strength. And I pray that that's what happens today, that you would teach far above my ability to teach and give us all ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord would like to teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Well, as usual, I want to give you some background on the book. This would be the exegesis. Uh, the author, of course, uh, 1 Corinthians, of course, was Paul the Apostle. In addition, in addition to the church being, um, uh, or Corinth being, one of the most important cities in Greece during Paul's day. It was a society deeply rooted in idolatry. And idolatry, you know, you, you can think of having one of those little statues or something that you burn incense to or bow down and worship it. That is a form of idolatry, but um, idolatry can be anything in your life that you place more importance on than God or anything that you listen to and place higher importance or value on than God. You know, it's, it's in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It even talks about not making any, you know, images. And that, that seems foreign to us. We don't have little images in our homes today, but uh, it's safe to say that many have idols in their lives. They're just not little figurines that you can see. But idolatry would be anything that becomes God to you in your life other than the one true God. And idolatry was rampant in Corinth. And Corinth was an interesting city because it, um, it was at a peninsula. And I've done a little graph of it here. And I'm going to use my nifty little... It's not working. Oh, there it is. I, I use it rarely. Okay, but that was Corinth right there. And this little isthmus, this uh, little peninsula right here, is um, where Corinth was located. And oftentimes, small ships were actually rolled or dragged across that uh, little peninsula there because uh, the 200 mile trip all the way around was very dangerous. So they would either, if it was a smaller ship, they'd literally drag it up 
uh, on, on logs and keep throwing another log in front of it and roll it across that little isthmus, or a ship would come in this way, a large ship, unload, they would move the cargo to a ship on that side who would take it that way, and they had a system going back and forth that was the UPS of that time. And um, it made it a place that was very popular for trade, commerce, business, a lot of money flowed through Corinth, and we know what money does. Uh, it, just, it just amplifies anything that's wrong in a person's life. Here, I, I, I included a picture of what it looks like today. Look at this. And that's something. And they finally modernized it and dug a canal. That canal is four miles long and 70 feet wide. And that's how they get the ships across today. They don't drag them across. But it's still there. It's still uh, used in a very similar way. But the city was also filled with shrines and temples. But most prominent was the temple of Aphrodite, who in that time was considered the goddess of love. And this is a picture of the ruins of the temple of Aphrodite. And this is the part uh, I said, you know, you might wanna, not want to have minors in the room if you research. Uh, people made use of what was estimated at a little over a thousand temple, quote unquote, consecrated prostitutes. And boy, I, I got to study in that. It was really um, turned my stomach. You know, a, a woman had to go in there and to pay um, um, homage to the deity, Aphrodite. She, she had to wait until a man was willing to give her some money to be intimate with her. And one of the things I read said that, you know, some of the women were not as beautiful as the others and uh, the woman could not leave. So a less attractive woman could literally be stuck there uh, for a long period of time. One study I read said it could be multiple years. But she could not leave until she, and it, and it was no set amount of money until she made an offering to the deity Aphrodite. This uh, debauchery <laughs> is, is not too strong of a word. As a matter of fact, I don't think this debauchery is a strong enough word of what went on in Corinth. The region thrived on commerce, entertainment, indulgences, and corruption. Pleasure seekers came there to spend money on a holiday from morality. I've tried to live right for a long time now, but I, I, I want to go take a holiday from morality. I want to just go and give in to all of my sinful desires. Corinth came, became so no, notorious uh, for its evils that the term Corinthi zomai, if I'm saying that right, meant to act like a, a Corinthian. If somebody referred to you as a Corinthian in a conversation, it was It was bad. <laughs> It was an insult. It meant that you were the worst of the worst. And again, the synonym became known for debauchery and prostitution. So maybe they used the ad campaign, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. It was like a modern day Las Vegas or... Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And in spite of the obstacles to the gospel, Paul was able to establish a Christian church there. Think about that. Of all places, the Apostle Paul was able to establish a Christian church there. In growing up, Missionaries would come to our church, and oftentimes at the end they would, they would pray. And let's say they were from a you know, deep, dark region of Africa, 
And after all of their pictures and everything, you know, no water, no television, no, <laughs> no nothing. It just looked horrible to live there. And at the end of their message, they would often pray and open the altar to any of these young people that would like to come and dedicate their lives to becoming a missionary in South Africa. And I was like, not me, not me. I don't feel it at all. I don't feel it at all. So I imagine when the Lord called the Apostle Paul to Corinth, he might have had the same feelings. Not me. I've been through there before. I think I'm going to leave that to somebody else. He may have even thought there is no hope for Corinth. There's no hope for the people there. It's, it's gone too far. You know, God has already turned them all over to an abased mind. In other words, they'll never hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. They've gone too far. But he didn't give in to those thoughts. He didn't give in to those feelings. He actually obeyed the Lord and, and went and successfully planted a church there and made a tremendous impact. Look at his impact even to this day on us because he obeyed the voice of the Lord that said, go to Corinth and start a church. Now, I want you to remember that, and I want to remember it too, when you feel a little something down inside of you, and it's the Holy Spirit telling you, witness to this person. Say something to this person on the job, or this, um, this person in the grocery store, wherever it may be, and your first thought is, oh, they'll never listen. I know a little something about that person, and they've gone too far. They'll, they'll never listen to me. I want you to remember this. The impact that it had on those people, and even us to this day, that a man like the Apostle Paul didn't give in to that resistance, not wanting to say something to somebody, and the difference that it made. And by the way... You have to ask yourself in that moment, what am I really afraid of? Something that I would say to them? Or, and, and that I might look silly for saying something to them? Or I'm really afraid about what God might say to them? Well, of course you're not going to worry about that. He knows what they need to hear. But he may be choosing you and, and your mouth to, to be the one to speak it through. I mentioned this before, but I, I really struggled with that. Years ago, any time I had a thought about delivering a message of any kind, because I would think, who am I? Who am I to teach this or, or preach this? And, and the Holy Spirit would remind me, you're nobody. <laughs> you're nobody. And that's why I'm going to use you. All I need is your willingness in your mouth. So when you're confronted with those situations, I'd really encourage you to remember this city called Corinth, and this man named Paul, who didn't give in to that, and he went and spoke the word of the Lord, and the difference, the incredible difference that it has made to us, even to this day. So he taught the word of the Lord there for 18 months, and after Paul left the area, Apollos came from Ephesus to minister to the church in Corinth. And in time, the church in Corinth began to experience difficulties, as we've already mentioned, and sent a delegation of three men who apparently brought a letter that requested Paul's judgment on certain issues. Paul wrote this epistle, and by the way, the word epistle just means letter. He wrote this epistle as his response to the problems and questions of the Corinthians. So he basically saw that even though he saved the church out of Corinth, he, there was a problem now to get Corinth out of the church. Isn't that something? As I thought about it, I thought that really sums up what ministry is like today in a church. I, I don't know that it's half and half, but just for the sake of the point, I feel like we spend half of our time getting people saved out of the world and into the church. And then we spend the other 50% of, of, of our time counseling and working with people to get, to get the world out of the church. It, it, it crept over. Or, the, or they slid back into it, like I said before. This book 
centers on the theme of correction of carnal living. And it's divided into three major parts. The first is Paul's answer to the report of divisions. The second is Paul's answers to the report of fornication and immorality. And the third is Paul's answers to the questions raised in the letter that he received. And today we're going to start with this first part, and that's Paul's instruction concerning divisions. Now, again, it's a challenge. Now, all of that up until now was really just an introduction to the book of Corinthians. But I can't skip that, or I shouldn't skip that, because even though it didn't dig into the Scriptures, we haven't dug in yet, it's important to understand all of that so that you get a full understanding as we do dig down into the Scriptures of what we talked about before, the context, what was going on in society, what it was like that. But now we're going to read, and we're going to, it's a, it'll be a lengthy read. We're going to read the first 21 verses. Read along with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Let me just stop there and say Sosthenes did not write any part of this book. He was more like a secretary that took dictation uh, that Paul dictated to. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Jesus Christ that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, and even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short of no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I plead with you, brethren, listen to the the tone of his voice here, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared to me, Concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, who they're referring to Peter there, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized None of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. And come to mind, I baptized the household of Stephanus. <laughs> Besides, I do not know whether I baptized anybody else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. I want to pause there and encourage you to underline that in your Bible. If you've got an electronic Bible, tap on it and highlight it. That just the second half, if you can, of that that last sentence, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. That that sentence, that second half of that sentence, is is really the crux of this, this whole first couple chapters of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I'd underline that one too. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. That's another important line. That through, uh, through wisdom, the world did not know God. It, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Okay, so the Corinthians were greatly influenced by the wisdom of philosophers. And two attributes of a great philosopher are intellect and articulation. Intellect, incredible intellect. You ever heard anybody speak or just in conversation talking to them that just had incredible knowledge, almost like they had a photographic memory. They, they could remember things, and they had so much intellect. And not only intellect, but the ability to articulate that. The, their oratory skills were just incredible, very important factors for a philosopher of that day. And when you found a great teacher, you became one of his students. Hence the phrase, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Peter. It was their culture. The problem with it was, is that it put all of the value and all of the importance on the teacher. And this was common in the Corinthian culture. So the Greek word for wisdom that we translate wisdom in our Bibles is, you want to guess? Sophia. Sophia. Now, see, I, I love that name. We have a young lady uh, in our church named Sophia. And I've told her, I, I love to say your name, Sophia. It's a beautiful name. And I want to be careful to say that the use of the word, uh, the, the Greek word Sophia could be good wisdom for sure. So it's not a bad word. It, a young lady named Sophia is not a negative thing. It can be the positive side. So there's definitely a positive side to Sophia, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about when it's man's Sophia. It's where we get our modern word philosophy from. Philo, meaning love, and Sophie, meaning wisdom. So, the word philosophy means the love of wisdom. And I also want to throw in a little disclaimer here. We talk a lot about wisdom here. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite passages when it comes to counseling somebody is James 1.5. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. He'll give it liberally and without reproach. He gives it to, to all, anybody who asks him for it. So we love wisdom, but again, that's godly wisdom. That's truth with a capital T. Truth that you can take to the bank. Truth that Isaiah 55, 11 says that if you speak it, it will never return void. So that's the wisdom we like, but what we're talking about today is the wisdom or the Sophia of man. And to understand the greater part of 1 Corinthians, you've got to understand this error. And by the way, this whole thing about Sophia is what I had never seen before. I suppose I saw, you know, uh, you know the, the effect of it and, and the references to wisdom of man, but I never really saw the importance of this Sophia in the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians. This is the big deal. This is the big deal. When we begin to listen to the Sophia, to the wisdom of a person, a man, or a woman. So many of the people in the church of God at Corinth were mixing this old habit that they had had for years of placing 
great importance on a man's Sophia or their own Sophia, their own wisdom. Well, I know God says this, but I really think this is more true for me. They were, they were mixing that with the gospel. They were mixing that with their relationship with God, their ability to be taught by God. Even after somebody, somebody that was so effective like the Apostle Paul and came in and taught them what was right, they began to listen to this other wisdom, this voice other than God, and it was distracting them from the truth. It was basically the thought that if it isn't deep or unique or original, it isn't truth. To the extent that they diluted and even excluded the meaning and the importance of the cross of Christ. They were confusing the gospel message with Sophia. As a matter of fact, they were thinking that the gospel was just some new Sophia. Well, this great philosopher has a concept of what is right and how you should live. And this great philosopher has his views on what is right and how you should live. Now, this is just, a, this is just Paul's philosophies. They were, they were mixing it. It was just like it was some new revelation, some new Sophia of man, as if to say that man has something to do with salvation. And if salvation rests on human wisdom, then salvation is something that rests on man. Do you see the problem here already? If sal salvation has something to do with me and, and what I do to earn it, we've got a terrible problem. When in fact, man has nothing to do with salvation, but salvation has everything to do with the cross of Jesus Christ. And man's Sophia says that the cross is foolishness. And that's the great problem. The seduction of Sophia nullifies the cross. And, and I, I'm making a big play on this word Sophia, and I'm doing it because I'm, 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 I know repetition is the best teacher. I'm trying to keep saying that word over and over again, so it becomes a, a little reminder to you of this message. That any time I, I, I feel myself forgetting the true message of the cross, that it was what Christ did for me on the cross that makes me a saved person. Uh, you need to hear alarm bells going off in your head. As soon as you start feeling like, well, maybe if I do a little better or go to church more often, which I highly encourage, <laughs> um, and, 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 I, and I, don't, I don't swear all week, and I, and I actually do a couple random acts of kindness. Yeah, how about that? I'll do a couple random acts of kindness. And now I feel like a little, a little better Christian. <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> no, that's, that's my wisdom trying to sanctify me. That's my thinking or my doing that's trying to make me righteous. And, and that's, that's one of the greatest dangers for a Christian. You know, I've always said that if I was the devil and Evie might argue that sometimes I am. I wouldn't go up to a Christian and tempt them and say, hey, go rob a bank. <laughs> go rob a bank. They're not going to rob a bank. They're not going to step off into some blatant kind of sin, not, not obvious sin. No, what I would do and what Satan does is you just distract just, just a little bit, just a little bit. I, I'm, I'm going to let you see things or influence you in ways to, to make you begin to question the cross. And of course, in that moment, you're not thinking I'm questioning the cross. 
But you're, you're in, the, in the midst of being tempted to believe that it's something that you can do for yourself to attain favor with God or to receive or, or, or uh, for Him to extend His love to you. Listen, I, I don't know if, if... I've had a hard time believing this. I tell myself often it's true, but you need to hear it too. God loves, if you're God's child, you're God's son, or you're God's daughter, God loves you unconditionally all the time, no matter what you do. Whether you're the perfect child or not. Now I've got to balance that by saying that doesn't negate all of the consequences and chaos and darkness and trouble that comes into your life when you do step outside of His will. That's, that's a principle He put in place from the beginning. And He's not going to negate that just because He loves you. Does He love me? Yes. Am I still going to jail because I robbed the bank? Yes. Maybe I'll have a Christian prison ministry. But he loves you unconditionally. The seduction of Sophia nullifies the cross. But what did the Apostle Paul say in verse 18? He says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us... Who are being saved, it is what? The power of God. The power of God. Now, if you don't think the seduction of Sophia is prevalent in our society, you and I are not living on the same planet because it is everywhere. It is everywhere and it comes at us nonstop to our eyes and ears nonstop. And it's not only blatant Sophia, it, it, it creeps in to the church. And the Apostle Paul, especially in Galatians, you remember our study on the book of Galatians. And by the way, every message that we've ever, every service we've ever had at Christ Family Church, uh, the whole three years is all online. It's all on our website. So if you ever wanted to go back and do a study on the book of Galatians, you just log on and click on the watch online button, and there they all are. But if you remember our study in the book of Galatians, Paul talked about this a lot. Teachers that seem like they're preaching Christ, but they're preaching or or including a little bit of other than. It happens even in the church. People flock to teachers who seem to have superior intellect. They've got knowledge that seems like it's deep. Or they've discovered something about God that is unique. Or they're preaching a message that is original. Nobody has ever taught this before. This has never been heard before. It, it is the seduction of Sophia. Sophia. And I'll tell you, I don't, uh, maybe I shouldn't get off on this little soapbox, but I'll tell you my personal opinion. Remember, I'm always careful about that. This is Paul's opinion, nothing more. Uh, as, as good and powerful as Christian television is, and I'm not, and I'm not against it, uh, I think there was a downside to it in that Christian television brought mega churches with mega money that had mega, you know, uh, incredible services, orchestras, you know, excellent concert style music, preachers that just, you know, could actually spend 30 hours into a message and had a team of researchers, research, brought that into our, our homes. And then what's the pastor, you know, in some small town thinking, all my people are seeing this, there was an undue pressure on pastors to have to become spectacular. There, there was undue pressure on churches to have perfect uh, concert-style music. And I I say it all the time. I try and balance these thoughts because I can imagine what people are thinking. They say one thing and people go the other. Uh, I'm all for being well-taught, studying, learning how to present a message. I'm all for the most excellent music we can, but those are not the highest values in church. They're not. 
And there was, I think, again, this is, I'm still, I better go back over here because I'm still on my opinion. My opinion is, is that it put a lot of pastor, a lot of pressure on pastors to have to become very clever now. I have to have to package these messages in a way that um, uh, when people leave, they, they, they leave talking about how, how deep he was or she was. Or uh, looking out and seeing, you know, saying a powerful statement and then seeing heads go down to their phone. Oh, I got to tweet that right now. I got to tweet. That was powerful. I never heard that before. There was this undue pressure on pastors to do that. And, and then it, it becomes more the intellect of the man. And, and what did I say? It's got to be either deep or unique or original. So to go to a church and hear a little podunk pastor like me just teach the Scriptures was not so awesome. And I'm telling you, it, it's, it's a, a temptation that myself and I think every pastor should do our best to resist. Nobody, I, I don't think anybody, I, maybe there are some extremists, but I don't think anybody does it intentionally. It just, it just seeps in. The seduction of Sophia, even in Christian leaders. We talked about this in our series on the purpose, requirements, and benefit of the church, that one of the top values in picking a church today is the spectacular messages of the pastor. And you might, you know, you might even be thinking, well, Paul, this is, this is a very convenient message for you because when it comes to preaching, you're not exactly the brightest bulb in the chandelier. You're not exactly spectacular yourself. Well, guess what? I never want to become spectacular. I, I'm, that's a genuine truth. I'm telling you the truth. I never want to become spectacular because I don't want to draw people to me as a person. I want to draw people to Christ. I want to draw people to the cross of Christ. And I, I bet you diamonds to, to donuts that Every one of us has been in a... You never heard that saying before? Anyway. Every one of us has been in a situation where somebody came to us for wisdom. And the fact that we could quote a little scripture to them or say, well, you know what? I actually have an answer for you. Wait till this hits your life. <laughs> and then you're going to go tell people, oh, when, when you need help, you need to go see you're going to need to go see her. I've said it before, but it bears repeating here. People are very kind after we counsel or whatever. They'll write us or come back later and say, I want to thank you so much for what you did for me in my life. We're always very careful to say we appreciate the encouragement. And that's, it feels good to be encouraged, of course. But we always say, remember, it was the Lord that helped you. If anything came through my mouth, it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the power of God's truth. It was the Lord that helped you. You need to remember this. When you're listening to preachers and teachers, and by the way, I'm not even saying that the, the preacher is always the one in error here. Now, the preacher may be doing just what he or she is supposed to do. Maybe preaching the unadulterated word of God just like they're supposed to. But, but, but the listener, like the Corinthians, could have this culture of Sophia in them that makes them idolize or put emphasis on the person speaking. I am of T.D. Jakes. Or I am of Joyce Meyer. Or I am of Ravi Zacharias. I would bet that any one of those, if they heard somebody saying that, they would be mortified. I don't want you to say you're of me or you believe in my teaching. I want you to say that you are of Christ. You are of the knowledge and the truth of Christ. You, you are of uh, the, the truth of the cross of Christ. 
I, I especially like Ravi Zacharias, but if you know who he is, you should... Um, there are people that God does give special gifts to. So I'm not, I'm not you know, suggesting that you don't listen to these people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we, we have to uh, uh, watch ourselves and be careful that we don't allow this, this seeking of, of wisdom transfer over to a person instead of God. Now, why is the seduction of Sophia so important to understand? Now, now listen to this. Why is this such a big deal? Because, as we'll see in the weeks to come, it is the root of the Corinthians' divisions and immorality. It's the root of it. Oftentimes, people will say, my life is so full of problems. And the more we dig into it, we find out that there's really only one or maybe two or three in the most extreme cases, just, just one or two root problems. But in different settings, in different circumstances, they sprout up and look different. But, but the root of them is the same. And if you can deal with the root, if you can deal with the real problem, all of this surface level stuff changes on its own because you've dealt with the real problem. And I'm telling you, this seduction of Sophia is the root of the Corinthians' divisions and immorality. It is the root of our divisions and our immorality when we dilute or deviate from the truth of God's word. God shows one of the most foolish ways to save us. It, it, it confounds the wise. He sent His only Son to live among us and to be tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet He did not give in to it. He didn't sin. And He was executed in one of the most inhumane ways known to man. Crucifixion was meant for only two types of people. Runaway slaves and thieves and insurrectionists. So think about this. Jesus didn't die on a cross. Didn't die the execution of crucifixion because of what he was even accused of. Or because he was Jesus. Think about this now. Jesus, the method of execution for Jesus was because he took the place of Barabbas. Barabbas was the thief in the insurrection. Think about that. You're Barabbas. I'm Barabbas. He took his place. He took your place. He took my place. The message of the cross, it is the power of God. He took our sins upon himself and he paid the price. He paid the price. Let me say it again. He paid the price for our salvation. Jesus and Jesus alone. No good behavior on your part. No wisdom on your part. No figuring it out on your part. No good actions on your part. And anything. That's why I'm saying I, I, you're going to get tired of me saying it, but this idea of the seduction of Sophia will draw your mind away from that. And that's where the trouble starts. Christ and Christ alone paid the price for your salvation so that you and I could be free and inherit everlasting life. And we must never allow 
Sophia to distract us from the cross. Would you stand? I'm going to say a closing prayer, and just like always, we're going to open the altars for prayer. And if today is the day that you decided you want to turn your life over to the Lord and receive that awesome gift of salvation, you come down and we'll pray that prayer with you. But if you have anything you need prayer for, you come on down. We always take plenty of time to anoint people with oil and pray just like God's Word says. And then, of course, at that point, we'll be dismissed and go over to our time of fellowship. I encourage everybody to come on over. I know it feels a little odd for new people sometimes, but come on over and enjoy a free lunch with us. But, Father, I thank you for your word. Oh, my goodness, I just I am overwhelmed by the power of your word, how I can read and study sentences and paragraphs that I have read and studied for decades and see something that I've never seen before. How do, how do you do that? How do you do that? I don't know, but I thank you for it. I thank you for it, and I thank you for this message today, and my prayer is that everyone that has heard this message would never give in to their own understanding, that they would trust on the Lord Jesus Christ and not lean to their own understanding. Not lean to their own Sophia, their own wisdom, their own ideas, their own or anybody else's that says anything other than what you have said. I pray that this message would be sown like seed in good soil that would take root and bear great fruit. And that some of our fruit would spill off into other people's lives and we would influence them with it. This whole thing about coming to Christ Family Church today isn't just for the people that, that showed up here. It's, it's, it's for the people that showed up here to now take it out into our communities, into our spheres of influence, to our jobs, to our schools, to our neighborhoods, to our friends and family. And share the truth of of the cross of Christ with others. And I pray, just like I said earlier, that as you prompt us to open our mouths and speak truth to somebody, to witness to them, to share the love of Christ with them, that every one of us would be emboldened, would not give in to the temptation of keeping our mouths shut. That we would see ourselves in that moment as the Apostle Paul walking into a city of debauchery like Corinth, opening our mouths and allowing you to speak through us and establish truth in others. I pray now for our time of fellowship that it may be sweet. We thank you for the food that you've provided. Ask you to bless it. I thank you for this wonderful church that is such a loving family that you would continue to lead and guide us, help us to minister to one another and minister to our community. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, you're dismissed, and uh, those of you that would like prayer, you come on down and we'll stay as long as people need prayer. God bless you.